The skincare industry in Korea is a scary place. It is cutthroat, for real. They will leave you in the dust. It's kind of terrifying. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today we're gonna to be talking about something that I get asked about a lot in my day-to-day, -day, everyday life, and that is what is the difference between Korean skincare and Western skincare? Now the reality is, is that they are pretty different. And today we're gonna to go in depth about what those differences are exactly. So the first big difference is proactive versus reactive. So K-beauty is all about preventing skin issues, whereas Western skincare tends to focus on solving problems once they're there. So for example, Korean skincare really emphasizes the importance of maintaining a healthy skin barrier in order to prevent blemishes or hyperpigmentation. Whereas Western skincare emphasizes using products that quickly get rid of blemishes or hyperpigmentation, such as zit zappers. Another example is that K-Beauty puts a lot of emphasis on using SPF to stave off the effects of aging. Whereas Western skincare puts loads and loads of focus on products that contain acids for example that get rid of fine lines and wrinkles when they're already on your face. Now that's not to say Koreans don't use acids and Westerners don't use SPF, it's just that there's more of a focus on one rather than the other. The kind of ethos behind K-beauty is to listen to your skin, figure out what it needs, use products and then over time see your skin become this really healthy radiant organ. So to that end, products tend to be a lot more gentle, which isn't really particularly helpful if you deal with things like hormonal acne, which is very unpredictable, or if you need a quick fix in the short term for a, an event or something. Whereas the Western ethos is very much about making your issues invisible, which is great because it really improves your confidence, but it becomes a problem when you're not really figuring out what your skin issues are in depth and so you can't do things to protect your skin and maintain your skin in the long term. Now, I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. Actually, I think you need kind of a, a good blend of both to create lovely skin, but I do tend to err on the side of the Korean skincare ethos. So now we understand that difference in ethos, the next biggest difference is that Korean skincare products tend to be issue-based, whereas Western skincare tends to be more general. So if you take a product from a Korean skincare brand, they'll tend to deal with a specific issue and only that issue. Let's take Laneige's hydrating sleeping mask, for example. That's all it does. It hydrates. It doesn't promise anything else. A Western night cream, though, might promise to moisturize, get rid of fine lines and wrinkles, get rid of hyperpigmentation, dark spots, all in one product. Another thing is that Korean serums tend to just promise one thing. So what we do is we layer them over each other. So a thin layer of one serum, a thin layer of another serum to get the benefits, to get the multiple benefits. Whereas Western skincare market tends to prefer products that do a multitude of things. For example, moisturizers that also include SPF are one of the highest selling products. So that's a pretty significant difference, specific versus general. Now that's not to say that Korean products can't do multiple things. Let's go back to the Laneige example of the water sleeping mask, even though it is for hydration, over time it will reduce hyperpigmentation and help up stave off the effects of aging. But in Korea we tend to like using more products to deal with specific issues and anything else they do is kind of seen as like a bonus. Now this leads us on to our next big difference, which is layering versus convenience. Whereas the Western preference is to use less products, but put thicker layers on. So it's much, much, much more convenient. And this certainly explains why the Western market is super hungry for products that can do multiple things. If you're only using four products, you need them to work hard for you. But if you're using 10 or 12 products on your face every night, then you can afford to be much, much, much more specific about what each product does and why you're using it on your face. This is, I think, shown really well in like the texture differences between Korean skincare and Western skincare. Um, toners, for example, in Korea tend to be much, much, much more watery uh, than Western skincare toners, which are a lot more viscous. 
And that's because in Korea, you put a very, very thin toner on, and then you put a very, very thin essence on, and then you put a very, very thin serum on. You build up these layers. So those big three major differences all kind of interacted with each other, they were all linked, but this next difference is kind of separate from the others. Now one of the biggest differences that I've noticed having experienced both is innovation versus brand loyalty. The skincare industry in Korea is a scary place. It is cutthroat, for real. There are literally thousands and thousands of companies all competing for visibility. The competition is so, so fierce and all of these companies are producing high quality produce. Also something important to say here is that the Koreans have no sentimentality about products. No. If a new product comes out with like a higher percentage of an ingredient or like a better formulation, they will dump their old product and they will go to the new one. They will leave you in the dust. It's kind of terrifying. So to survive in the Korean skincare industry, you've got to innovate. So to that end, Korean skincare is constantly bringing out new ingredients. Bee venom, snail mucin, ginseng, also new techniques, fermentation, ginseng, seed extraction, things like that. And this research and development is going on at an extraordinary pace, which makes the industry so exciting. Whereas Western customers are much, much, much more likely to stick to a product or stick to a brand if it works for them. I have friends in London, for example, who have used the same product for years and years and years and refuse to try anything new. And why would they? It works for them. And it's interesting, you can kind of see this in the advertisement. A lot of skincare companies in the West use brand recognition and nostalgia a lot in their advertisements and in their ad campaigns, much more so than in Korea. In Korea, the advertisements are much more likely to have what's in the ingredient, what's the new techniques, why this is a higher percentage. They, they, they talk about the ingredients a lot more rather than, oh, this is from this brand, therefore it's great. Or like, your mum used it, your grandma used it, you should use it too. That kind of doesn't really work in the South Korean advertisement world. I've actually done a whole video on Korean innovation and trends for 2020. If you want to check that out, I think it'll be a really, really interesting watch for you if, if that's what you're interested in. Um, I'll put the link here somewhere. But do that after because the next difference I'm going to talk about is something that I think most people will be the most interested in. I need some tea because it is chilly. Please excuse me for my rudeness. So Korean products are designed to be layered onto the skin in lots and lots of very thin layers and patted onto the skin, right? Another huge, huge, huge difference between Western skincare and Korean skincare is the difference that's very, very close to my heart because pretty much my biggest loves in life are money and macaroni and cheese. And my boyfriend. I should probably have said that at some point. Anyway, so this difference is that Korean skincare tends to be inexpensive, whereas Western skincare in general tends to be more expensive. This difference is absolutely huge and it was a huge reason why I got interested in Korean skincare in the first place. It completely changed the way that I viewed skincare and the way that I viewed how I could look after my skin. Using Korean skincare products allowed me to use fantastic ingredients and really high quality products on my skin at a price that I could afford. I didn't feel like I was excluded from having great skin because I didn't have a lot of money. This is in part because of the super high levels of competition. It's definitely in companies' interests to keep costs competitive so that they stay relevant. The other reason is because manufacturing costs are significantly lower in Korea than they are in Western countries. Korea has a super well-established manufacturing system and so companies can create products for much, much, much less than other countries can. In the West, skincare production is vastly more expensive. But also Western skincare brands tend to mark up their products due to brand recognition. So there's much more of a culture of 
buying products because you want to buy the brand or because you think it's going to look good on Instagram, which of course Koreans do as well, they do a lot of it, but it's much fiercer in terms of making sure that your product is of super, super, super high quality. If it's overpriced and not great, then Koreans will just move on. They'll move on, you'll be left in the dust and your brand won't be able to survive that. So those are what I think are the biggest differences between Korean skincare and Western skincare. Of course, there are lots and lots and lots of other smaller differences, um, but the I think I've pretty much covered the really important ones. I really love doing videos like this because it's kind of like really getting into the nitty gritty of what skincare is, what the industry is about, um, which I just love and would spend hours and hours talking about. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Bye!